I didn't know that I was going to get a master's degree on the fly in disaster management and now be leading a charge, not just in my state, but nationwide to get more of that money into mitigation. Results, better, not perfect. I think the biggest problem that we have in government locally, statewide and nationally is, is that everybody stops doing better because they, it needs to be perfect for them to be able to vote for it. And so I believe in the get stuff done motto. The only real progress in this world is imperfect, relentless progress. I kind of switched my mantra from one of saying like, like that our purpose in our office was to serve our community to our purpose in our office is to serve the greater good. That's my job. I just raised my hand when I saw something that needed to get done. And so, you know, I, I started to just kind of become the de facto leader because I was willing to sit up front and be involved. Welcome to The Good Government Show. I'm Dave Martin, and you're about to hear my conversation with James Gore, County Supervisor in Sonoma County, California, and Second Vice President for the National Association of Counties. And we met up at the NACO Legislative Conference in D.C., so you can hear that conference going on in the background. When you talk about Sonoma County, the first thing that comes to my mind is wine. Turns out, James is a vintner, so we talk wines, Zinfandels, cabs, you name it. This is a man who knows his wines. But we also discussed, among other things, some of the wildfires that have hit his area. And dealing with that has helped make James a, a sort of an expert in resiliency and firefighting. So we talk about how the county prepares for fires. We also got to check in on the progress of a story we did back in season one. Sonoma County built mini houses for homeless veterans. And we got an update on that program. So there's more good government news. James Gore was born and raised in Sonoma County. But after college, he left for the Peace Corps in Bolivia. We talk about what he did there, including sampling the local coca leaves and horseback rides through the jungle, all to improve agriculture production there, and how he met his wife. Back in the USA, James was the assistant chief of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service, and that was in the Obama administration. There, he led nationwide conservation efforts at the intersection of agriculture, business, and the environment. In 2013, James returned home to Sonoma County and a year later was elected to the Board of Supervisors. He was so successful, he ran on a post in 2018 and served that year as chairman of the Board of Supervisors. So after a break, you'll hear my conversation with James Gore. And since it is Sonoma County, first we talk wines. And I'll have that after this. The Good Government Show is sponsored by NACO. That's the National Association of Counties. County government is actually the oldest form of government in the United States, and it touches more people directly. Roads, highways, hospitals, schools, recycling, law enforcement, water and sewers. In most of the country, those services are maintained by the county. That's county government. NACO is a nationwide organization that represents all 3,069 counties across the USA. NACO helps county government work better together through things like sharing best practices, because when county government works well, well, that's just good government. Welcome to the Good Government Show and a conversation with, and right now we're having a conversation with James Gore. James, if you would, introduce yourself. Uh, tell us where you are, where you're from, what you do, what your title is. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I. I like good government. That's why I'm here. I consider myself a public servant, not just a politician. Good, good. Um, James Gore, county supervisor in Sonoma County, California, north of San Francisco, NorCal. Um, I'm in the leadership of NACO. I'm the second vice president, so I'll be the president here in a couple of years and past president of California counties. But for me, it's really, uh, you know, I live in the trenches. Uh, each and every day, we're, uh, we're hammering out the issues in our communities that people see each and every day. And I find purpose in it, even with the burden that I wear around my neck. So it's yeah, a pleasure yeah, right, to be with right. you. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here, but yeah. let's talk about the real, the real yeah. issue in front of us here. Yeah. Sonoma County. Yep. Wine. Oh, talk about God wine. bless you. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What do you, what do you make in, in your part of uh, Sonoma? What, what are they, what well, are they growing? What are they, yeah, what are they so, mixing? What, what's the last bottle you opened? Well, the last bottle I opened was Gore's Infidel. Our, okay. our, our Zinfandel. I opened up some last night in our suite and had it. Yeah, we you do. Yeah, wine. we do. I grew up in a vineyard family and in a winemaking family. Can you family. ship that to Brooklyn? Absolutely. All right, good. Yeah. Good. All right, yeah. Good. Good to know. You can ship anything to Brooklyn, they yes, tell me. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So uh, uh, you said a Gore's Infidel. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you, like I live in a place that we, we have the Russian River Valley. So we have Pinot Noir. We have Chardonnay that are just coastal influence, like in the fogs down there. Right. We have uh, Dry Creek Valley, like in my backyard, which is more Zinfandel and Syrah and kind of those meaty, like really strong, potent, intense. That's kind of like and what the, I drink. Yeah. And then, yeah. We have, uh, and then we have Alexander Valley, which is King of Cabernet out there, kind of on the bridge of Napa. Napa and, and Alexander Valley kind of touch together. And between those valleys and like the 16 microclimates, you know, you have huge distinction in one county. But it also is one of the reasons that we have so many disasters, so many uh, issues, so many uh, flooding, drought, fires, and all these other things is because it's yeah, this Yeah, we'll get to all that stuff place. in a minute. Let's stay on the wine yeah, for a moment. Exactly. Um, how important is is the wine industry to your to your county? I mean, oh, wine, wine industry and the ag industry is the backbone, right? Of my of my okay. community. If you think about it, you know, for our gross kind of metro product as a county, we're talking about you know two thirds of it really being derived not only from the ag industry, but like all of the other tourism, uh, you know, the food the the food and the restaurants, which are all kind of like brought together by this, right? So, so if, it's you go, a, if you go to a restaurant, you order a martini, do people stare at you? Go, oh, no, wine? we're equal opportunity, <laughs> right? We do okay. spirits. We have great breweries. Right. Uh, you know, we have ciders. We're, we're, we're rolling. I mean, it's a bountiful place. Like, it's a beautiful place in this world. I did not know you were a vintner. Is that fair yeah, to say? Yeah, that's fair uh, to all right. say. All right. Do many people have some connection to the industry? You know, everybody who is there... Not everybody. I mean, let's just say it like people love it. Yeah. Right. People love the industry. But at the same time is, is that if you really get deep and you don't just do the high level hospitality side of it yeah. and the tasting rooms and the other things is, is that there's a deep culture there that is just fun and it's rural. And, you know, where I live, it's really the buffer zone in between the population driven Bay Area, San Francisco, Oakland and all these other areas. Right. And then the northern wilderness, because up north of me, you go to like Mendocino, Humboldt, Del Norte, and that is like sparse gorgeous, you know, forested countryside. It's it's very they're, different. They're growing other stuff up there. Yeah, hey, Emerald Triangle, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a brother in the wine business and I have a sister-in-law, his wife, who has a cannabis business. They're called the Wine and Weed Couple. I bet. Yeah. Talking that about good government. That must be a fun place to go to for dinner. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, all right? right? Good, good, good. <laughs> all right, well, I, I would love to talk wine all day. I don't think day. we can ship that to Brooklyn. <laughs> no, but we'll, we'll, I'm going to give you my address later. We'll, we'll, we'll talk. I had a, I had a Zinfandel Fidel last night, so I, I, nice. I'm ready. I like that. Um, yes. You touched on something else that uh, Sonoma, I guess, mm -hmm. is, is uh, a, a challenge you have to deal with regularly. Wildfires, forest mm -hmm. fires. Um, I, I gather this is probably one of the chief problems that you have mm -hmm. to face, and you don't know when you're going to face it. You know, this cycle of fire, flood, drought, fire, flood, drought. And the fires that you were talking about are really wind-driven storms. These are not just smoldering fires in the countryside, right. like trees that are ready to burn. We're talking about 50 to 100 mile an hour winds coming east to west. We call them Diablo winds, Santa Ana winds down south in California. And they just burn us out if they come at that time. And we have totally adapted all of our systems to be a top-in-class emergency management division, alert and warnings to our community, resilience groups in different neighborhoods, but it is a full-time job making sure that we stay on top of the climate changes that we're facing and the resilience that we're building in our communities. Can you prepare for some of these? So, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, there's a couple ways you look at it. One is, is that managing an entire forest for a forest health is a very difficult thing. And sure. really, fire is a part of forest health. Right. That's one of the things that's difficult. But we have a lot of people people who live in the forests. And I'm not just talking hundreds, I'm talking thousands, right? Yeah. So working with people on home hardening, on defensible space around their their, their, their properties. And then for us, who, we, who runs, we run the Department of Emergency Management, what we're doing is, I mean, we're neck deep in like evacuation and evacuating entire communities to hold the flank when we have those fires. Are, it's it's intense. Are, they, are the folks who live in the forest receptive to suggestions and better ideas? Yeah, receptive is 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 an absolute but what strikes an ability for somebody to change 
as a broad level is usually more than receptive and just information. So what's happening is a lot of people are having to take action because their insurance uh, plans are being dropped. Okay. Right. Or, uh, or <laughs> I in don't want to do that. But yeah. I have to do that. Yeah. I well, I gotta, cause it costs a lot of money to do defensible space. It costs a lot of money to do home hardening. You know, you can't just spend three or 4,000 bucks. You got to like go in and, and, and hammer it. So we do things like we offer low interest loans for home hardening that can go onto your property tax rolls, PACE loans, other things like that. We're always finding ways to incentivize good in our community. Do you have any background in forest prevention or fire prevention or emergency services? You know, I'll tell you, it's one of the weird things about this job is that you have to kind of like, uh, you know, Trial by fire, pun intended, right? Okay. So so we've had five mega fires in this time, and I'm now on, like, the FEMA National Advisory Council. I was a chair of the Resilient Counties here. Like, like I didn't know that I was going to get a master's degree on the fly <laughs> in disaster management yeah. and now be leading a charge, not just in my state but nationwide, to get more of that money into mitigation, which is really – upstream investment, preparedness. And, and once again, we're talking about fires, but really we're talking about dramatic changes in precipitation. We're talking about atmospheric rivers that dump a lot of water at one time, but don't really saturate down into the aquifers. We're also talking about like, uh, you know, th two droughts in 10 years that dry out our forest lands and then a ton of rain at one time that'll put a lot of like vegetation up underneath the trees. So there, there's, there's a lot of changes that are happening that we don't get to decide, but we decide how we're going to respond to it. Can you, is, I live in New York City. Yeah. We don't have a lot of forest fires where yeah. I live. Yeah. Um, certainly, you know, I pay attention to what happens, you know, in the national media, but it always seems like we hear about something two or three days into it when it's sort of gotten to be a bigger fire. Yeah. Um, in those first days, um, are there... Have you learned that there are steps you can take? So, yes, there are steps we can take. The difficult thing is, is it really depends on what kind of fire it is. If it's a fire, even in the middle of the summer, we had dry lightning a couple of years ago. Right. And dry lightning, will, after a couple of days, it'll smolder and we'll find a place where it lights up. That's one thing. But what you have, what we really watch out for are things that really the partnerships with National Weather Service and others, red flag conditions. That's like hurricane warning, right? Okay. High winds, low relative humidity, high temperature, right? Like if you get those conditions, it's go time. And you got to make sure that you're ready to evacuate communities, that you get people out of the way so they can defend homes instead of evacuating you on the fly so you don't have... Uh, roads fill up with traffic. I mean, so what it is, is it's having, it's, you know, if you're, if you're on your heels, uh, just by an iota, you get smoked out by these things. Once yeah, again, I'm, sure. I'm throwing all the puns at it, yeah, yeah. but like you got to be three or four steps ahead and make sure you know when those winds are going to come because the wind driven storms are not just fires. That's the equivalent of like a tornado or a hurricane for California. It just means it brings the fire with it. You're a county supervisor, which is essentially a county commissioner yep. uh, in California. Um, how long have you been doing this? What got you into it? Oh man, I, I you know, what got me into it was I just... I just give a damn. And for some reason, it just kind of led me to raise my hand over and over again. And, t and then I decided at a certain point, it wasn't happen chance that I was actually going to have to like intentionalize and do it. So I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I, I moved to DC afterwards and I worked in private business and represented the wine industry. But then I, uh, I missed public service. So I uh, worked for the Secretary of Ag and Persistent Poverty Areas. Wow. Getting our programs. And then what I was decided- peace, What was your Peace Corps uh, assignment? You know, Bolivia, South really? America. Wow. I was on horseback down in the jungles for no two kidding. years. Met my wife there. Had to go to Bolivia to find a blonde Texan. How crazy is that? <laughs> She's amazing. And so uh, and so she and I have, you know, we got an amazing did you go, life. Did you go to the place where Butch and Sundance? Uh, I tried to find it. Yeah, I tried to find it. Place? Yeah, where they did. That's, that's yeah, what I, couldn't that's find what I know it. about Bolivia. I love that you say uh -huh. that. Absolutely. Yes. Now, nah, but Bolivia was crazy, right? I, I mean, bet. it was a crazy what place. What were you trying to do? You know, natural resources and ag. So, I mean, I built water systems with community and dug trenches for two years while we were chewing coca leaves and like, you know, Does hanging out. Does it really make you work faster? Uh, yeah, but it's not like, I mean, it's not a full-blown drug. It's more like chewing tobacco or something okay. here in the U.S. Everybody right. kind of does it while they're working. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. a cultural thing. All right. Um, 
So, uh, what's going on in Sonoma? Uh, we, we've talked about wine and we've yeah. talked about disasters. What else is wine? Is we did a story uh, last season, I think our first season, yeah. on some mini houses for veterans. I think there were oh, 14 yeah. mini houses you built for veterans. Um, I recall it was, uh, I remember one of the people we spoke to said, um, my house is, I can't remember, 250 square feet of paradise. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How are the houses doing? They're doing great, and we've expanded it. I mean, it's not just for veterans. We've now expanded. I mean, a big part of our homeless strategy is making sure people are housed in interim solutions so that we can get them to permanent housing. You know, with, with homelessness and, and the overla overlapping issues of mental health, substance abuse, uh, you know, other things that we deal with, we have to lean in. And one of the things is, is you can't do programs without uh, placements anymore. Okay. So we have uh, a new area, Los Gilicos Village, which is all these tiny homes that are set up, about 70 strong. 70? We have, uh, we purchased probably uh, in our county with our cities, six different hotels and motels and retrofitted those into transitional housing okay. and other things. Partnership with the state, state putting 75% down. You not think of Sonoma County as having a homeless issue. Oh, Yeah. You know, the homeless issue, one of the things that you see for us, I'll speak for California specifically, is, is that, you know, decades ago, there was a decision made to close all the institutions and maybe that was the right decision, but there was no other alternatives put. So just put it all out on the streets. Okay. Right. And ironically, uh, you know, the fact that we have good weather, even in the wintertime, makes it, uh, you know, very difficult to manage. And so but we realize also that 80 percent of our homeless population has been in our community for more than 10 years. A lot of them have grown up there okay so it's not just this transient issue of like what's going on and I can't just make it disappear some people think I can just show up like the men in black and like make everybody forget and like no. get rid of everything right I'm like no these are these are our neighbors even if they're homeless houseless right so I got to find solutions for them because solutions have to be in community and solutions will piss off my constituents because it also means that we're going to be Solutions hurt as much as uh, as as much as problems do. It means right. you got to put us put a you know put facilities up. So now that we've gotten the, the conversation out of the way, we're going to get right to the heart of this. Yeah, let's go. We have all right. We have our questionnaire here. Okay, and uh, we're going to start here now. Um, what is good government to you? You're a county mm. supervisor. Uh, yeah. You also had the unique perspective of being past president of county commissioners mm -hmm. for the entire state of California. Mm -hmm. um, define good government. Results results better not perfect I think the biggest problem that we have in government locally statewide and nationally is is that everybody stops doing better because they, it needs to be perfect for them to be able to vote for it and so I believe in the get stuff done motto so how do you hold yourself accountable you know I at the end of the day I hold myself accountable by just by by, by my own sense of of, of like seeing the results, seeing the roads paved, seeing homeless solutions, seeing those other things in my community. But with my constituents too, is as I say, I say, bring it on, hold me accountable, right? Well, that was my next question. Hold me accountable. How do they hold you accountable? Well, you know, I mean, there's always an election that happens, yeah. right? That's that's the biggest accountability How many measure. How have you been elected so far? I just got elected my third time, so, right? So far, I guess. So far we're doing good. The biggest thing that also my constituents, what I realize is, is that they accept imperfect, relentless progress which is our mantra coming out of the fires. Say the, that again? the only imperfect. real progress in this world is imperfect, relentless progress. Imperfect, relentless yeah. progress. Yeah. Okay. Results. I mean, you got to tell people I'm fighting and, and I can do better, but I can't make that perfect for you. I mean, you got to bring it back to basics. So uh, if they see that you're working your tail off, that your team's working hard, you're responding uh, and you're honest with them about things. It's amazing how, how far that goes. It's amazing. And you said <laughs> you said results. Um, yeah. Are you looking at big results or small results or anything? Oh, uh, I mean, you know, you got to you got to be able to deal with the small stuff if you want to be innovative and do the big stuff. I don't get to try and uh, create a, a clean energy future or restore the, the the river the river if I can't fill potholes in my community. And that's the stuff that erodes public trust in government. Is if you can't fill potholes, if people can't get a permit, right? So, man, I'm neck deep in doing like internal audits on our permitting department, and then like driving driving more funding into uh, into uh, road striping and other things. I'm you know, it's 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 incremental and it's big deal. And if people if people aren't seeing what they think are the results they want, what should they do? 
They should get active. They should get loud. I mean, I always say that don't complain if you're not willing to be a part of the solution, but being a part of the solution doesn't mean that you have to put time in. It means that you have to vote. It means that you have to, you have to make your voice heard. I'm like, like bring it on. My, my goal is to make things better, right? And uh, Does whilst, that make it tough when you're walking around the, the, the county and the, and the community? Yeah, you know, my wife sometimes like won't let me on the weekend go to the hardware store because that could be a seven-hour <laughs> constituent <laughs> meeting is session. Is that true? It's, I'm serious. Yeah. Ace Hardware in Hillsburg, I'm not allowed to go there on Saturdays and Sundays. My really? wife, yeah, I, I will. All of a sudden, I just might as well grab a chair and just talk to people about permits, potholes, clean energy, like, uh, you know, so uh, she says we're out of milk and you say, I'll bills. go get it. She goes, yeah, no, 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 I'll do no, it. No, 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 no. <laughs> I got to hide out. Um, we don't have that kind of time. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, it's, I, 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 we work where the rubber meets the road, but it, but it also means that you get road rash. I yes. mean, like, you know, you get tired of, 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 of it being a, like, like every time uh, if, if I pave a road and I post on Facebook, we paved Piner Road. You know what happens? I get 500 comments from people who are like, well, why didn't you pave my road? Oh. Right. But you got to get used to the fact that you don't do this for the for you. If you got to do it for the service, you so don't get it was relentless, imperfect, relentless progress. progress. OK, you got to do it. We got for, to that road. We're going to get to your yeah. road. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And, do and people, you know, are they receptive to that answer somewhat and some aren't. But like, I, I you know, I. I kind of switched my mantra from one of saying like, like that our purpose in our office was to serve our community to our purpose in our office is to serve the greater good. That's my job is to serve the greater good, which means sometimes I got to be, have some straight talk with folks or tell them I can't help them or get to know quick. Right. Be it rather than wasting their time. Uh, you know, I got to, I got to prioritize our time and my time, my team's time. You may have just answered the question by saying prioritize, but what would you like, what would you like the people to know about government as a government mm. insider. What would you like people who aren't government insiders to know about government? Well, I'll start with the local level, which is just that, you know, the majority of people who serve are, are good people who do care. And uh, I really cringe when they're called politicians, especially local peoples who are on school board, water districts, county commissions, other things. They're not getting paid a lot. They don't have a lot of staff. They get yeah. a lot of grief. And they actually are just willing to not scream at their TV or write an op-ed, but get involved. So my thing is, is that the world is run by those who show up. So make sure you're there and, and realize that especially those who are operating in the trenches, you know, they're, they're not the divisiveness in the theater that you see out in Congress. Congress and in other places, you know, they have to operate in public. They have to balance their budget. So um, and I would just tell the public is, is that don't be afraid to, to get involved yourself. Uh, there's a lot of people who have very loud voices, but um, they don't show up when it's time to vote and they don't show up to uh, put their name on the ballot. So be the change you want to see in your community. All right. Here's an easy question. Yeah. Who's your hero in government? Oh, man, I'll tell you, I still love a, lo, lo, love this guy, Teddy Roosevelt, from Days On Gone By. Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. You know why? Is because I, I really loved the straight talk stuff. I mean, I think some of my favorite quotes from him, you know, everything from like, it's not the critic who counts, it's the, you know, man or woman, in this case, in the arena, covered in blood and sweat and tears. You know, if you look on the other stuff, I mean, he was kind of a wild card. At one point, he was, I mean, he was a Republican, but he was also a trust buster, right? Like, yep. with big businesses and other things and outdoors. And I, I think that there's a lot of stuff that we need to look to this uh, I'll say my favorite quote is that he says don't talk about rights without responsibilities right okay and I think that's a big thing that our country needs to look back to and look forward to we could do worse than have Teddy Roosevelt as an example I go. suppose there all right go. you've just opened a bottle of wine Tell me what wine you just opened and tell me what you're having with it. Ooh, well, I was just talking with your colleague here and he said Jordan Cabernet from Alexander Valley. Yes. And I had some Jordan Cabernet. <laughs> and John Jordan is a good guy and his All family right. does great work. And they have their vines are just like on this little bench cut just up above the floodplain in Alexander Valley. So when I open up that wine, I think about like kind of the, uh, you know, a summer where it's going to be 95 degrees, but it starts off at like 62 degrees with the fog kind of pushing away. Okay. going back to the ocean. The vines have slept overnight, right? It got cool enough. It's not like the Central Valley where they burn out, right? Like they get a chance to mature, not just ripen. Okay. And like you go up to this place and you're just overlooking Alexander Valley and you see the difference between, you know, these these valleys, the foothills and the mountains. And, um, and it's just a reminder that like the best grapes are, are, uh, are grown under stress. 
Okay. Kind of like people in government. So what are you having with that glass of uh, of, oh, uh, man. of Jordan? A rib Cabernet. eye. Rib eye. <laughs> Prime cut. Right. Seared. Very good. Very happy. Back on the grill at home? Oh yeah, I can cook a better ribeye than any restaurant. <laughs> come out, uh, come on out and visit. I'll show right, you some well, good listen, government. I, you, well, you're, after you, you send me a couple of bottles, and we'll, 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 we'll then we'll come yeah, out. And we'll try I, the. Others. There's no ethics rules that say a politician can't give you wine. Absolutely right? not. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, so is 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 this something you always aspired to do? To be in mm. politics? To be in government? Were you president of the high school class? Is this something you always you know? You do? I was quiet in high school, and then I just kind of I, you know what I did is I I just raised my hand when I saw something that needed to get done, and so you know I, I started to just kind of become the de facto leader because I was willing to sit up front and be involved, and so I never had this. I, I wasn't giving speeches. I wasn't there, there. You wouldn't see me and be like, you know, back in the day that he was yearning for something like this yeah and um i was a late bloomer but uh but this this sense of of like you can be a part of changing the world that my mom and my grandma instilled in me and uh and then realizing actually you can if you step up and you get involved small or big and then things like peace corps and other stuff it, it you know it tasted good it's kind of like a good wine they say okay. it needs to have not it just taste good it needs wine, to have a good it, it needs to have a good finish yes so like when i would do these kind of experiences the finish felt like like the best thing a, a good wine the best finish you want is more more right and so I feel like that was this sense of civic purpose keeps me involved even through the burden of public office we talked about the expansion of your tiny houses you talked about some of the uh, mm. the, the paved, paved roads you've done uh, any other examples of good government in, your, in Sonoma oh yeah I mean we took over um, basically from our utility the entire procurement for all of our uh, energy and we have uh, something called Sonoma Clean Energy a, a community choice aggregation we have 50 million in reserves we're lowering people's bills and we've uh, by 40% reduced our carbon footprint in our county Okay, uh, we've expanded expanded operations and energy in the geysers. We have the largest geothermal facility in the world up in our mountains above us. You know, we're moving heavily on conservation on the Russian River and restoration efforts. And then with mental health in our jail and other things, I mean, I'm, you know, neck deep on uh, continuing to provide more options so that we don't just have people come into jail, back out on the streets, come into jail, back out on the streets. Our jail, 50% homeless, or 40% homeless, 50% mental health. 25% of that requiring direct intervention, and that's normal in this country. So we are we got major stuff that we're working on that needs to be reformed. Wow. Working our tail off. I guess so. Each and every day. Imperfect, uh, relentless <laughs> progress. Imperfect, relentless progress. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Uh, a, a great conversation with you, James Likewise. Gorth. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you, David. Uh, I look forward to sampling yeah, some, let's do this some, again. some Gore's Infidels. Let's do this again. And, uh, and uh, we'll come out and have a steak. Yeah, yeah, Thanks perfect. for your time. Yeah. Thanks for coming Thank by. You. Thank you. Kutztown University is a smart choice for Pennsylvania students or students from anywhere looking for an outstanding college experience close to home and in the heart of Pennsylvania. With over 130 majors, KU has endless academic opportunities. Kutztown also offers plenty of on-campus housing, 24-7 dining options, comprehensive support services to ensure our student success, and so much more. Kutztown has 22 NCAA Division II sports teams and a nationally recognized men's rugby team. How about that? Plus, you get it all with the affordable tuition of a state university. So visit kutztown.edu on the web, kutztown.edu, and see why it's good to be golden. That was James Gore, winemaker, wine drinker, and county supervisor from Sonoma County, California. As you heard, imperfect, relentless, Progress. I like that. Imperfect, relentless progress. That's how he moves forward. Not a bad philosophy. So thanks for listening. I'm Dave Martin, and that was a conversation with James Gore. Join us next time for another conversation with another leader in government on The Good Government Show.
The Good Government Show and a Conversation With is produced by Valley Park Productions. Jim Ludlow, David Martin, and David Snyder are the executive producers. Our editor and producer is Jason Sturchik. This is The Good Government Show. Thanks for listening.